Well, good morning, Sister Shirley. Good morning. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. <laughs> thank for you for asking. It's such an honor. It's an honor to have a person such as yourself, a tra trailblazer of value with us and a part of our membership. Thank you. Now, I see here that you were educated in Dallas. Yes. And that was at Booger T. Washington. Right. And tell us a little bit about Booger T. back in the day. Oh gosh, Booger T. was a powerhouse in this community. We only had three schools that blacks could attend. That was Booger T., Lincoln High School, and James Madison. And, uh, and Booker T was such a premier school because of Dr. J.L. Patton. He was a product of the school system and was well known and respected in the community. Well, is it true that Booker T. Washington was the very first black high school in Dallas? Yes, it was. The very first, and then Lincoln came next, and then James Madison. I see. Well, Tell me, what did you think about attending an all-black high school? Well, because I went to an all-black elementary school, it didn't, it didn't even phase me. It was just what was done at the time. And we caught a bus from West Dallas. I would take shoes and a sack because I was, there was not a paved uh, street, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At North Sidewalk, mm -hmm. and so I would take uh, good shoes and a sack and would walk up to the bus station in my muddy shoes, and then when I got the Booger T, I would exchange shoes so that I would look like the rest of the kids who came from paved streets and sidewalks. <laughs> Well, did you ever think about the difference in the education that you were getting or the black students were getting versus white students? And what year was that? That was uh, uh, 59. 1959. Yes, when I graduated from Booger T. And so four years earlier would have been 19, what, 54 when I went over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, even to this day, I think that black children received a better education in the predominantly black schools or the black schools at that time because they were all black schools. And that's because you had teachers who cared about you and teachers who parents respected highly. So if the parents would call the uh, if the teachers would call the parents, uh, you were in deep trouble. <laughs> you were, because the teachers were never wrong. So if they had to call your parents, <laughs> you better look out. <laughs> you better look out. And so they really cared about the students, and they knew they was gonna face a hostile world. So they would say, "You going to learn because you need to know how." to get out there, and quite frankly, you need to be twice as good to do the same thing that other. To get the same opportunity that other non-blacks receive. Non-blacks receive, that's exactly right. So what was your main interest in high school? My main interest was photography, and just getting through. <laughs> getting through and getting out. <laughs> getting through and getting out and working on a job. Had no idea that I would go to college. So since you weren't really focusing on that, how did it happen? One of my mentors, in fact, not only was she my mentor, but she was also my daughter's mentor. But uh, I went to see her after graduation, and she asked me, what are you going to do, Shirley? And I said, well, 
Mrs. Ross, uh, I'm going to work. And then, because it was a teacher, I said, and then I'll think about going to college, but I don't have any money, so I have to save up. And immediately, she went to her and picked up her phone, called Dr. J.L. Brown at Prairie View a and and said, I have a student who will be up there in August for freshman orientation, and she needs a job. <laughs> And I packed that one suitcase because I had no idea what I would need up there and went to Prayer View. And there I stayed. And you have no regrets of that, do you? None whatsoever. But I tell you what's the funny thing about it. I didn't realize the influence of her name uh, when she uh, when she died was Mackenzie because she remarried after her husband died. And uh, I, I went to Prayer Review in August because freshman orientation. And then in December, when the freshman term, uh, was the first semester was over with, I called Mrs. McKenzie one night about 11 o'clock because the rates went down at 11. So I called her on a collect call and I said, uh, Mrs. McKenzie, I to appreciate everything you've done for me. But it is so hard. I said, I'm working all that I can and my parents do not have enough money and I'm just gonna have to come home. And she said, well, okay, Shirley. And she hung up. Now that was 11 o'clock when I called her. And the next morning I went to my classes. And on my way back to the dormitory, everybody was saying, the dean want to see you. The dean want to see you. And I said, oh my God, what have I done? I tried to think, what have I done? Miss, Miss McKenzie's going to kill me. And I went to his office and he said, you are not going home. You will stay here and finish. And I just broke into tears because I said, I didn't call Mrs. McKenzie until 11 o'clock. So she had to call somebody that night mm -hmm. and say she better not come home because of no money. And I graduated from Prairie View. That's, that's a wonderful story. And that just shows you how much further the relationship goes yes. in segregated schools because the teachers, the deans, the principals, they all took care of us. And, and have genuine interest and in genuine us. Genuine interest and if you wanted to do, they would see that you were able to do. That's exactly right. So uh, let's, let's Look at this picture you have. And this tells the educational history of me and my kids. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I was the first in my family of eight children to attend uh, college and graduate. My children, even though I was number six down the line, are the first to graduate from high school and graduate from college. And so one day I just looked at my picture, my graduation picture, and I saw my daughters and my son. And then I had our diploma, so I uh, put the diplomas in a frame and I put them around. And I've also done the same thing with a college degree also because that was something that I was extremely proud of, them going on to make a, a name and a place for themselves in history. Well, thank you. That is something to be proud of. And I see here that you were a family historian, and so you just migrated over to black history? Exactly. And what happened there is that uh, I was interested in it because of Dr. J.L. Patton Jr. coming by classroom and talking about black history. And that kind of evolved into uh, uh, family history. And I knew I was interested in that. 
But I did not get into that heavily until after my mother passed in 1984. I didn't want to say step on my mother's toes to do a lot of digging in history. But when she passed, then I knew that uh, a lot of this history was being lost. And so uh, Fran Brown, a lady that had worked with me on my campaigns in Carrollton, she was at a flea market and she saw these black pictures from Mahair, Texas. And she immediately purchased them because she said one thing is, it is a very rare thing to find any kind of black pictures at a flea market. So that interests her right there in the first place. And then when she looked down and saw they said Mahair, Texas, she said these might be Shirley's family. And she brought them to me. And uh, then somehow the story got started and uh, it ended up on the first page of the Dallas Morning News. I got teased from my friends because they called and said, Shirley, you was on the front page and you did not shoot anybody. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I guess I was proud that I had a friend and that I had talked about my family enough and how they grew up in my head, Texas, and uh, that everybody knew my story and she saw the interest there. Mm. That is great. Now, tell us something about uh, you and Carrollton. Okay. Well, when I... Uh, when I, we were living in Hamilton Park in an apartment when my husband and I married. And I became pregnant with my son, Jarrell, and I told him that I am not going to raise a child in an apartment. So you better get out and find me a home. And so he did. <laughs> and since we both worked in the North Dallas area, uh, the realtors started looking all over Carrollton and the North Dallas area. And we stopped in and saw this home that was two years old and the people had moved out for whatever reason. And I liked the lights that was hanging in the den. And, and based upon that almost, I said, okay, this is the home I want right here. So my husband went down and made a contract on it. and. Uh, I moved in, and then I was working at Collins Radio, which was, oh, at least 15 miles. So that was a 30 mile trip. So I said, now this is ridiculous. I have a teaching certificate. So I marched myself up and I told Don Sheffield that I needed a job <laughs> that was close and I was a certified teacher. And so he said, I'm gonna hire you. He said, the, the government has been on us, but I'm not going to let them tell me what to do. So I'm going to hire you because I like you. And so that's how I became the first black high school teacher in Carrollton, Texas at R.L. Turner. So not only the first black resident, right? right? In, in the white community. In the white community. That's right. And then the first black high school teacher. Yes. So it doesn't sound like you had a lot of problems in Carrollton. I really didn't. And, and I can tell you, I believe I can contribute that to the students. Somehow the students fell in love with me, I can say. And they didn't care where I was. They would come up and hug me. They would offer me their sandwich. and. M&M's, they put them in my hand, and I said, God bless these here M&M's, and then I throw them in my mouth because I didn't want them to say I didn't appreciate them. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was a nice thing. And in fact, that's how I uh, became the God-given mother of Carl, my son, because he was one of these great, football, basketball players in Carrollton, and so he was in my uh, math class, my business math class, and he could see that his status on that basketball team didn't mean a thing to me. He was going to learn like the rest of the students in there, and he started calling me 
his mother. Now I got two mothers. I have a black mother and I have a white mother. They just stay on me all the time or something to that sort. I don't exactly remember. And I said, yes, and I am. And I knew that it had grown to be more than that when his real mother passed from cancer. So he came over to see me and he cried and said, I only have one mama now. Mm -hmm and that's you. And so I was so, I, I, the emotions, you know, it, it was just unbelievable. And I knew there was a role that I had to play in his life. In fact, when he got married and he and his fiance came bouncing over there to me and said, we're getting married and since you are my mother, you have to be in the wedding. <laughs> And I looked at him and I said, Carl, the joy that you have just given me can never be replaced. I said, but remember, there are two sides to this family, your side and her side, where you might love me. He said, oh, we've already talked to them. If they don't want to come to the wedding because of you, they don't have to. So that let me know that uh, Carl was something special in my life and would always be. And his feelings were genuine. Yes. It just wasn't about school. Uh -huh. Well, also I see here that you were the first African American female to integrate and serve on the Carrollton City Council. Yes, I was. We had had one gentleman uh, to run for City Council and it was unsuccessful. And then the community leaders, the black community leaders, had come to me and asked me to run. They said, you have name recognition, you have all of these students out there that loves you, you need to run. So finally, on the last day of filing, I called Mrs. McKenzie, my mentor, and I said, Mrs. McKenzie, they want me to run for city council, and I am torn between should I do this or not. And she said, I don't know why you calling me. Why aren't you down there picking up those papers? I said, yes, ma'am. I hung up that phone, and I went and got a package and filled it out. So, and that's how I happened to run for city council. Well, you were also the first American, uh, African American board member of Carrollton's Park Board, and didn't I see something about you being also the first mayor pro tem? Yes. Now, how all of that came about is because of my children in school. I was highly involved with them, so where they had to be, I was there. So T.C. Rice, who was the director of the park board at that time, he came to me and asked me if I would serve on the board. I said, nobody's going to vote on me to serve on that board. He said, don't you worry about it. So I told him, okay. And so that's how I uh, started working on the park board was because of that. And I served six years on that park board, and they asked me, to continue to be on that. I said, no, y'all need to let someone else come and serve on that board, uh, some other black person, because I have run my course and you need new ideas from the people who have elementary kids to be on that board. Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, an elected mayor pro tem, you know, I do have a mouth, they say, because I don't mind expressing myself when I think things are unjust. And uh, so I was such an outspoken person on city council. So we vote on the ones that will be the, uh, the council vote on who's gonna be mayor pro tem. It's not an elected position. So I guess they liked me enough that they uh, voted on me to be mayor pro tem. So that's how I became the first African American
in 2009, along with Sister Rachel Lewis, you led, you two led the fight against the Carrollton Farmers Branch School District, who initially denied seating a newly African American elected school board trustee, Richard Flemings. Yes, Richard Fem Richard Fleming was a student of mine, and he won. He beat out the president of the board who had been there for 19 years, and Richard beat him out. And But they didn't want to seat him, because then that's when they said he lives 18 inches or something like that outside of the school board zones and all of that stuff. So I went to a meeting. And I got up and told them only one person could hold that seat. Richard had won it, and they better leave him alone, or I was going to file a lawsuit. And they did not leave him alone. So I filed a lawsuit, not for money, but just for justice. The people had elected him outright. So why wouldn't they... Just let him be seated and be through with it. So that's how that uh, evolved. Okay, um, you were a fighter, and it does not look like you intended to be. It just happened <laughs> to you. <laughs> exactly. So, um... Is there anything else you want to impart wisdom to our younger generations and um, who have not experienced the things that the older generation had to go through, school, living, or anything like that? It does not sound like you've had problems. And that's a good thing to hear about Carrollton since that's where we're located. Exactly. Well, the only thing that I would like to add to the students is, uh, especially the black children, my father said, and I can remember in the backyard he was talking one day and he said, you came from extremely good stock. He said because in the Mill Passage, when they were bringing the blacks over, only the strongest survived. And he says, so you are somebody. You don't have to try to be somebody. You are somebody. And you act like it. You do everything you need to do to make yourself successful. In fact, one of the things that I used to hear uh, around the schools, because I... Uh, did that was that why do your kids walk with such pride and why do they have such assurance that they're going to make I said because they are somebody and they don't have to bow down to people God made them somebody so that's all they had to do was walk in the assurance that God loved them and they could do and be anything they wanted to be. And so, therefore, that's the same thing I would import to all of the black children. You are somebody. You do what you want to do. And then, don't forget, don't forget to give all of the credit and the honor to God. And I told my kids, there is only one person that loves you more than I do and can do more for you, and that is God. And I know that to be true. Because, and the only reason I don't love them more and would do more than what God will do is because I don't have the capacity to do it. I just don't have. God is all merciful, all love, and all caring. And everybody needs to realize that and to give him all of the glory and the honor for that. Well, thank you, Sister Tarpley, for sharing those words with us. <laughs> we really appreciate and love you. Okay, thank you.
you were a fighter and it does not look like you intended to be it just happened <laughs> to you <laughs> exactly so um is there anything else you want to impart wisdom to our younger generations and um who have not experienced the things that the older generation had to go through school living or anything like that it does not sound like you've had problems and that's a good thing to hear about Carrollton since that's where we're located Exactly. well the only thing that I would like to add to the students is uh, especially the black children. My father said, and I can remember in the backyard, he was talking one day and he said, you came from extremely good stock. He said, because in the Mill Passage, when they were bringing the blacks over, only the strongest survived. And he says, so you are somebody. You don't have to try to be somebody. You are somebody. And you act like it. You do everything you need to do to make yourself successful. In fact, one of the things that I used to hear uh, around the schools because I uh, did that was that why do your kids walk with such pride and why do they have such assurance that they're going to make. I said because they are somebody and they don't have to bow down to people. God made them somebody. So that's all they had to do was walk in the assurance that God loved them and they could do and be anything they wanted to be. And so therefore that's the same thing I would import to all of the black children, you are somebody. You do what you want to do. And then, don't forget, don't forget to give all of the credit and the honor to God. And I told my kids, there is only one person that loves you more than I do and can do more for you, and that is God. And I know that to be true. Because, and the only reason I don't love them more and would do more than what God will do is because I don't have the capacity to do it. I just don't have. God is all merciful, all love, and all caring. And everybody needs to realize that. And to give him all of the glory and an honor for that. Well, thank you, Sister Tarquay, for sharing those words with us. <laughs> we really appreciate and love you. Okay, thank you.